Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be here today. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, is that working? Everyone seeing uh, an image? Yes, it works for me. Okay, perfect, perfect. Uh, okay, for, so for those of you who, who don't know me, uh, my name is Eric Kurland. I am the founder and director of 3D Space, the Center for Stereoscopic Photography, Art, Cinema, and Education. Uh, it's a museum of 3D here in Los Angeles. And uh, uh, I have been doing a bit of research into the connections between early 20th century stereo views and uh, uh, silent films of the period. Uh, it's interested me for quite a while. Um, there have been some excellent articles in Stereo World magazine. Uh, there was an article in volume 29, number three, on stereos from Hollywood's golden age. Uh, article by Fenton Richards that focused on photographer Alexander Kali and the work that he did on uh, quite a few silent film movie sets. And in the March, April 2013 issue, uh, there was a really great cover story written by John Dennis, uh, all about the stereo views that were uh, created for Universal Studios in 1923 on the set of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. So uh, as a filmmaker, this is a subject that I've been very interested in. And uh, when the National Stereoscopic Association offered their uh, Stereoscopic Research Fellowship, uh, I applied in the first round and uh, was fortunate enough to be one of the first people selected. So I got to spend two weeks at the Library of Congress. Uh, what you're seeing there is the the sign at the desk they had me set up at in the Kluge Center for Research. Um, and for two weeks, I got to go into the photo and prints division and go through the stereo view collection, um, digging through, looking for anything that was silent film related. Now, uh, you're probably all familiar with uh, Harold Lloyd and uh, how much of a, a stereo fan he was um, you know in his retirement he uh, became the spokesman for the stereo realist cameras he shot over a quarter of a million realist format slides but his interest in 3d went all the way back to his days making silent films and uh, he had actually invited photographers from the keystone company to come to several of his sets and shoot stereo views uh, for his own personal collection so uh, uh, he has a whole bunch of these. They were never commercially re uh, released, but uh, these stereo views were produced by Keystone. And uh, when I visited the Johnson Shaw Museum, uh, the Keystone Museum in Pennsylvania, I actually found this little caption that talked about how Douglas Fairbanks kept a Keystone library that he actually used as reference uh, for building sets for his foreign pictures. So uh, uh, he would say that the, the stereographs were actually the authority on what the sets should look like. And Fairbanks actually did also have Keystone photographers visit his sets. Uh, here's a still from uh, uh, Robin Hood. You can see this is a behind the scenes shot. You can see cabling on the floor. So if you've ever visited Disneyland uh, prior to COVID, um, you probably remember these machines that were in the Penny Arcade on Main Street. These are duoscopes from the Exhibit Supply Company out of Chicago. They were one of the largest manufacturers of Penny Arcade machines. Uh, they invented the claw game. They uh, produced the, the strength testers, love testers, all, the, all those Penny Arcade machines. And they made stereo drop card viewers. Uh, I used to love going to Disneyland to see these, and especially the the two on the right. The one in the center uh, features a silent film actor named Bull Montana, and the one on the right uh, features a chimpanzee who talks on the phone and smokes cigarettes. 
So there's uh, the, the marquee card for uh, Bull Montana. Uh, and he was a, a, a known silent film actor in the 1920s. He played a lot of uh, boxers and villains and uh, made some films with Douglas Fairbanks Sr. Uh, here's a stereo view from that set. And you can see it says copyright 1927 ES company. That's uh, the exhibit supply company. Uh, we'll refer to it as ESCO. And then, oh, that one didn't. Let me do this. There we go. Okay. Uh, monkey business, and you can see the, the chimp. And uh, okay, so what do a boxer and a chimp? Uh, I'll have to do with Hollywood. Well, well, we'll get to the chimp a little bit later. So in uh, looking around for uh, materials for the museum, uh, I came across this. This is called a photoscope. And it's also made by the exhibit supply company, uh, coin-operated stereoscope. And uh, these also would have been sold to the Penny Arcades. And inside you can see it's got uh, a spool with a whole bunch of drop cards. And when you insert a penny, a clockwork mechanism starts up and it drops a sequence uh, these machines do a sequence of 13 cards, and they all tell stories, and a lot of them feature uh, silent film comedians and silent film Western actors. So I've acquired a number of these machines for the museum. I currently have four on display there, uh, three photoscopes and one duoscope. And uh, you can see each of the photoscopes uh, has five stories. The duoscope has two. Um, and I actually just recently at an estate sale uh, got another photoscope that I need to uh, get all in working condition. And uh, here's one of the sequences. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me was they actually uh, gave billing to some of the actors who appeared in them. So this is uh, silent comedian Jimmy Aubrey in The Loose Nut. And I'll just step through these quickly. These were photographed inside the machine because they're very fragile. You can see the stories told in 12 pictures. And there's the back glass, uh, Jimmy Aubrey in The Loose Nut, uh, Eddie Gordon in, uh, what is that, Mosquito Trouble. And each one of these, uh, they, they had their fake Charlie Chaplin, um, who appeared in several of their stories, and uh, a number of other vaudeville and silent actors. So I started looking into the exhibit supply company. Uh, they were based out of Chicago, but they claimed to have a Hollywood studio where they were producing these stereo views. They uh, listed quite a few actors that they were working with. And uh, I ended up digging around and found an exhibit supply catalog. Uh, this one's from about 1930. I want to read something to you from in here. Uh, they actually have a, a page that shows all their photoscopes. And they have a page that lists their uh, exhibit stereo views. And in the text here, they say 
uh, you see the same movie stars for one cent as shown in the highest priced movies in town. So they were in the penny arcades trying to compete with the, uh, the Nickelodeons and cinemas. Ben Turpin, Walter Hires, Jack Hoxie, Helen Holmes, Billy Dooley, Jack Duffy, Bobby Vernon. Uh, they list quite a few of the actors that they worked with. And they say, uh, we have unlimited facilities in our Hollywood, California studios to obtain studies of the most beautiful subjects. So I live in Los Angeles. I have a lot of resources here to look up Hollywood history, and I couldn't find any record of Exhibit Supply Company actually having any kind of studio in Hollywood. Yet they were producing all of these cards. Uh, here's a Western card that features Jack Hoxie and Helen Holmes. And uh, in digging in, I actually found this image in the collection at the Library of Congress. So uh, at the Library of Congress, I spent two weeks going through all of the exhibit supply and uh, several other companies' stereo views that were silent film related and did camera scans of over 2,000 stereo cards that were in the library collection. Uh, and then I cross-referenced them with uh, copyright filings and um, uh, spent a couple of days going back and forth to the uh, motion picture division to see if I could find any correlation between the stereo views and any of the silent films that they had preserved. And I came across one card set that I found really, really interesting. Uh, it was called Buddy's Wild Merry-Go-Round Ride. And here I'll show you an image from the set. So it's a, a sequence of cards about this little boy, Buddy, who gets into some mischief on a carousel. And this really interested me. I found this card set on uh, the first day I was there. Um, it's a really unique carousel horse. It's sort of this seahorse uh, dragon kind of thing. And it occurred to me that if I could identify the carousel that this unique horse was on, maybe I could figure out where this image was photographed. So as it turns out, there's an enthusiast group for just about everything. So just like we have Stereo World magazine, there is a carousel magazine. Um, and there was a 2019 issue that featured an article that had the same carousel horse. Uh, they noted that in the early 1950s, this particular carousel was at the Hoppyland Kitty Amusement Park in Venice, California. And uh, that was an amusement park owned by uh, Hopalong Cassidy. And uh, um, the researcher at the magazine did a little bit of uh, digging in to figure out what the backstory of this carousel was. And they were able to determine that it was originally built in Tacoma, Washington. And then they uh, suspected, they didn't have direct evidence, but they suspected that in 1923, both the carousel and a Ferris wheel were relocated to uh, California to uh, the Selig Park Zoo in the Lincoln Park neighborhood of Los Angeles. And that was a big clue because the Selig Park Zoo was uh, owned and founded by Colonel William N. Selig. Selig was the first movie producer who uh, uh, started in Chicago. His studio was called Polyscope. And he was the first producer uh, to actually come to Los Angeles and open a studio to take advantage of the year round sunshine. Um, he was uh, shortly followed by Max Sennett, who opened the Keystone Studios right next door to his. And what Selig ended up doing, he bought a menagerie of animals from uh, a sort of a traveling show run by a fellow named Big Otto. Um, uh, story goes, Big Otto was a gambler. He had some debt. He was looking to sell his animals and uh, Selig saw this as an opportunity. So he moved all these animals to Los Angeles and opened a zoo 
And then directly next to the zoo, he uh, built a movie studio with a whole bunch of stages. The idea was it was a one-stop shop where you could go and rent a lion, rent a sound, uh, rent a stage, and shoot a jungle action movie. And uh, uh, he was doing pretty well with this venture in the teens. And then when World War I began, um, he sort of shuttered the production business and shifted toward a rental facility. So into the 1920s, the Seelig Park Zoo operated as a public zoo. The public could come see all the animals. But anyone who wanted to shoot uh, a film there could rent an animal, rent studio space, and shoot whatever they needed to shoot. So I started suspecting that maybe these cards, maybe the exhibit supply company was actually using the Seelig Park Zoo Studios as their Hollywood studio. Uh, looking through further cards, I found another card that featured uh, the carousel. And this one had this uh, older gentleman riding on a horse. And uh, he was identified as a character named Uncle Josh. Now, this is uh, a vaudeville actor, uh, Cal Stort. Cal Stort, uh, his claim to fame was playing a character called Uncle Josh. Uh, started in uh, uh, the vaudeville stages and then went on to do this character in uh, radio. And the premise was he was a, a, a country rube. He uh, would visit the city and it was sort of the, you know, country mouse, city mouse kind of story where uh, 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 he'd make fun of all the city folk and, and all their customs and things. And the character of Uncle Josh was so popular that uh, around the turn of the century, from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, Thomas Edison did some knockoff films featuring the Uncle Josh character. So here's one. Uh, these are silent films, so I'll talk over it. Uh, Uncle Josh is at a movie theater in the big city. And... Uh, as the movie starts, he doesn't understand the difference between watching a movie in real life. So he jumps out of his seat and starts dancing with the woman on the, on the, the screen. And then in something of a, a tribute to uh, the Lumieres, he sees a train approaching and thinks it's real. And jumps back into his box. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. The character was so popular that Edison did several knockoffs of the Uncle Josh character. So I found it interesting that uh, the exhibit supply company was also doing their knockoff version of Uncle Josh. And uh, this subsequent card in the set shows the Uncle Josh character sitting with a chimp. And uh, that also got me thinking, yeah, this probably most likely was uh, taken at the Seelig Park Zoo. Then I flip the card over and the back of the card says Uncle Josh at Seelig Zoo. And there we go. I had uh, uh, my corroborating information there. So they were, at least in 1923, shooting hundreds of stereo views at the Seelig Park Zoo and facilities. Uh, a couple days later, digging through these cards, I found another set. And this was the set that I'd seen years earlier at Disneyland 
featuring this chimp talking on the telephone and smoking a cigarette. And as it turns out, uh, this chimp was at the Seelig Park Zoo. She was known as Mary the Educated Monkey because she had been trained to do all of these things. And uh, here's a picture of uh, Mary the chimp holding her cigarette with Colonel William and Seelig himself. She was, uh, yeah, one of his prize animals, and she was rented out to quite a few movies. So it was great to finally have uh, all the information I needed to know where these images were taken. Now, uh, Exhibit Supply Company worked with quite a few well-known silent film comedians and Western actors. Uh, here is the copyright filing for a set that they did with Ben Turpin. And there's the back of the card. And they were engaged in producing, uh, as I said, there were, there were hundreds, thousands of cards produced um, between 1923 and about 1930. And here's an image from one of the Ben Turpin cards from 1927. Uh, Turpin was, was uh, best known for being cross-eyed. And uh, here's Turpin with, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure what these cameras are. Uh, this picture was, was sent to me and I have not been able to identify who the other gentleman is um, and what this photo shoot might have been. If anyone has information about this particular shoot uh, or can identify these cameras, I'd love to know. You talked to Mike Ballou? Uh I have. Uh, he, he didn't know. So in my research, I also came across the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company. Uh, now, this was a company, uh, actually one of the first motion picture companies in the late 1890s, they started producing mutoscopes. These were uh, coin operated machines that essentially showed you a flip book. Um, in the early 1900s, they were also producing their own stereo views for uh, drop card machines. And uh, here's a page from an advertisement. And here's one of the American Mutoscope and Biograph cards, this one for a series called Jolly Mr. Jack. Uh, so I did some research looking up American Mutoscope and Biograph to see if I could determine uh, where and who was producing their stereo views. And I actually found an article uh, about a film in 1904 and in looking at this article, I thought I recognized the set. And it looked very much like the same set that was in the Jolly Mr. Jack card. So that got me thinking, it, was it possible that they were actually shooting their stereo views concurrently with the films that they were making in 1904? And uh, at the Library of Congress, they had the Jolly Mr. Jack set, uh, or at least selections from it. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the drawbacks at the Library of Congress is that apparently in the early 20th century, um, it, there were a number of odd copyright rules. First, you, you couldn't copyright a, a motion picture, but you could copyright a photograph. So silent films early silent films in order to copyright them they actually had to make paper prints of every frame and then copyright the photographs of each frame uh, so quite a few of the earliest silent films only survived because the library of congress had stacks of photographs of every frame of those films as these sequential stereo views go uh, you didn't need to copyright the whole sequence. You only needed to copyright the first one, one from the middle and one from the end. And uh, so these companies at the library 
uh, I could find card one, card eight, and card 15, but I couldn't find entire sequences. But this Jolly Mr. Jack story, uh, Mr. Jack apparently runs a theater and uh, his wife and her friends show up and have some complaints. And then we see the, uh, the women in the dressing room in their uh, uh, stage costumes. And then Jack the Peeper, Mr. Jack, comes out of uh, the back of the dressing room and I cross-referenced this with copyright records in the motion picture div division, and I actually found that they had a paper print that they had digitized of a film called Mr. Jack in the Dressing Room. And here we are, now it's flipped, but it is the same set, the same cast and the same costumes, and uh, was filmed also uh, the same month in 1904. So it really does seem that American Mutoscope and Biograph uh, was producing these films and these stereo views at the same time with the same cast on the same set. Um, all of the stereo views that correlate to films uh, seem to have been done by uh, director A.E. Weed. Then there, Mr. Jack's wife comes in with her umbrella that we saw in the first stereo view card and drags him out of the room. So um, to kind of bring this around full circle, I had mentioned that there was a Stereo World article on the stereo views from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, and I was very fortunate uh, that this set recently came up at a heritage auction and I was able to acquire it along with the cards that were produced two years later in 1925 for the Phantom of the Opera. Now, these were very limited uh, uh, promotional sets commissioned by Carl Lemley at Universal uh, to give to exhibitors and promote these upcoming pictures. So I'm, I'm uh, currently in the process of doing high resolution scans and restorations of all of these cards. And hopefully I'll be able to find a bit more information. Uh, we don't know who photographed them. I do have some information about the advertising agency out of New York that was commissioned to produce them. Uh, so hopefully I'll be able to, to dig in and find out more about these cards for uh, a follow-up article. And then I'd like to close out here with uh, just a sequence. Here's a uh, fake Charlie Chaplin from Exhibit Supply Company. And I'll just step through these for you. And then here's a, a Western, uh, this one featuring uh, actor William Fairbanks. And in this one, card five is very interesting to me, because if you look at the reflection in the window, you can see the photographer caught his reflection. Uh, unfortunately, on the card, I've tried zooming in, and uh, there's just not enough detail to be able to identify the photographer or the camera. But this card fascinates me.
And I have all 15 from this set because I, uh, it's actually in the duoscope machine that I have at the museum. And then the most recent exhibit supply company that I uh, set that I got features uh, a silent comedian Lupino Lane doing his famous scissor dance. So there's Lupino. Uh, I'm missing the first two cards in the set, but I have the rest. And again, they were producing these uh, in the mid 1920s to compete with motion pictures. And this was a dance that he was famous for doing on film. So at this year's 3D Con, um, I went to the dealer's room and approached all of the vintage card dealers, asking each one of them if they had anything for sale from the Exhibit Supply Company or American Mutoscope and Biograph. And none of them knew what I was talking about. I tried explaining that these were cards made for these drop card machines. They were never sold to the public. They're uh, rather rare because you only find them inside the machines. And uh, again, they didn't know what I was talking about. I ended up asking, do you have anything that's just silent film related? And one of the only one dealer had one card. He said, I think I have something with a cowboy on it. And he pulled one card out. And as it turns out, it was an exhibit supply company card. So I, th I think that just shows how little we actually know about these. If the dealers don't know these cards from the company that made them, um, looking through the old, uh, text Treadwell books, he misnamed the company. He called it the, the ecstasy company rather than exhibit supply. Uh, so I think there's very uh, little actually known about how these were produced, who took them. And uh, I'm looking forward to another visit to the Library of Congress at some time in the future uh, to dig in more to the copyright filings and find out what I can. Uh, one last thing, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this. When I was at the Library of Congress, I uh, was able to camera scan about 2,500 cards that they had in the collection. Uh, but there were about 5,000 copyright filings. So half the cards that are supposed to be at the Library of Congress have gone missing. And in talking to the librarians there, they said, uh, there are several possibilities. One is that um, they have storerooms full of boxes that have sat there for decades that haven't been cataloged. And it's possible that there are lots of stereo views that just have never made it into the system. Uh, two, because they were listing the names of known silent film actors, an employee at the time may have walked home with these, uh, or, and what they said is probably the most likely, is that at the time that they were transferred from the Copyright Office to the Photos and Prints Division, um, the library may have said, well, we don't need 5,000 of these. They're not fine art, they're entertainment. So we'll just take the first half because the cards that they have begin at 1923 and end around 1925. So the other half could still be there somewhere, or it could have been transferred to a, another library or museum. Uh, again, if anyone has any information about exhibit supply company cards or American Mutoscope and Biograph cards that are out there, I'd love to be able to get scans of them. So thank you for your time. And uh, uh, if anyone's got questions, I'd be happy to answer them.